So I'm going to open today with this word that um, a lot of the times I prepare my messages uh, three or four days in advance, and I'm you know prayerfully going through it, and God's revealing things slowly. This week was a little different. I didn't get a message till around um, nine o'clock last night. <laughs> God just dropped something in my spirit, and I began to put down some notes. So hopefully it all comes out okay, and we go through this together and see what God wants to say to us as people today. Amen. So can we just stand and open in prayer and just ask God to reveal his word to us today? Father, we thank you for your word, Father. We thank you that it's, it's sacred, it's awesome. And we thank you, Father, that it's able to accomplish what it's sent forth to accomplish. In fact, it will accomplish what it's sent forth to accomplish in our lives. So God, give us eyes to see, Father. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God, the author of this book, is going to say to our hearts today. Let us not leave here the same. Let us leave changed by the power of your Spirit. And to you be all the praise and glory. And everybody said, Amen. 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 It's awesome. So what I'm going to do is, I, I know so many people want to hear a little bit from um, Alex and his journey over the past year, so maybe next Sunday I'll have you share a little bit if you're, if you're open to that. I won't put you on the spot now, give you a week to settle in, but we do want to hear from Alex. How many want to hear of his um, thing? Did, did you want to say something now or you want to wait? It's up to you. Yeah, you're going to shave your beard for us? No. Yeah, okay. So, so the, no pressure. Next week, he's going to share a bit of his story. So three, four weeks ago, I spoke a message uh, entitled, Make Space for Grace. How many remember that message? Okay. And um, as Christians, we have to be careful. We, we're saved by grace, right? Through faith. And so so easy to get off track. We can, move, we can move from grace, and grace is really God's divine influence upon our hearts, producing transformation in our lives. So God sends a spirit into our lives, begins to transform us from the inside out because of his divine favor. How many, how many have experienced that? One day you were in darkness, one day you saw things a certain way, then you get born of the spirit, God comes and lives inside of you, sets up his throne on your heart. Next thing you know, your appetites change. How many know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about your appetites for different things. I, I can't watch the same movies I watch. I can't talk the same way I talk. I can't hang out in the same. Why? Because my appetites have changed because God's grace has come and there's been divine influence upon my heart. God took out the stony heart and he gave me a tender, responsive heart. I have an issue sometimes as New Testament saints when we go around quoting Old Testament verses and say, the heart is deceitfully wicked, who can understand it? Now that's a true statement, but once you've been born again, the miracle of rebirth has taken place, and God sends his spirit upon your heart, and he births in you a new heart. And so your heart is no longer deceitfully wicked. You're a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Some things have become new. Is that what it says? All things have become new. Now, as New Testament saints, we have to make sure that our spirits aren't defiled by sin or iniquity, because they can be defiled. How many hear me? You can be unrighteous, but you can no longer be wicked, because God has recreated your spirit. Isn't that awesome? And so, last week I talked about, uh, a few weeks ago, the Church of Galatia, and how Paul rebuked Peter and Barnabas because they were playing hypocrites. They, they gave up Judaism, they gave up the, the traditions and uh, the law that they were following in Judaism, and they became like Gentiles, and they were just living by faith like Abraham and loving God and walking out their life, right? And then all of a sudden, they're in Galatia, and what happens is uh, some Jews come into town, and so they say, okay, we're not going to sit with the Gentiles now, we're going to go sit with the Jews, because, you know, and so they started hanging out with the Jews and becoming a clique away from the Gentiles. How many know that passage? And so what happens is Paul rebukes him and says, hey, you're playing the hypocrite. You don't even follow the Jewish customs, but you're acting like they're superior to the Gentiles. What's wrong with you guys? It's, it's faith. It's grace. It's the grace of God putting your faith in Jesus Christ that transforms you. He says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 3 to 5, he says, how foolish can you be? How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? And you know what? We can look at that and say, yeah, they were silly. But you know how easy it is for us to do that? 
We start in the spirit. We start by relationship with God, and then we just get into the systems and structures of our Christian faith. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read more because i got to please God. No, you do it because you love him and you love hanging out with him. Look at the next verse. Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was, it was not in vain, was it? He says here in the next verse. Sorry, I'm following the projector, so. Surely it was not in vain. I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? He says here, of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. So we need to read the Bible with the right glasses on. When we read the scripture, we have to look for the author and finisher of our faith throughout the scriptures and allow him to transform us by his word. He talked to, Jesus spoke with the Gentiles, or sorry, with the Pharisees. In John chapter 5, this is what he said to them, verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think they give you eternal life. But the scriptures are pointing to me. You're searching, you're going through the scriptures and saying, how can, how can we get better? How can, how can we please God? And how can we, you know, fine-tune our lives? And, 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 and Jesus says, you're, you're, you're looking through the scriptures trying to find the formula for eternal life. He says, it's talking about me. Hey, I'm the formula to eternal life. If you love me and trust me and put your faith in me, I'll transform you by the power of the Holy Spirit. So last week, a few weeks ago, sorry, I keep saying last week, but it was a few weeks ago, we talked about um, making space for grace. And the main scripture that I used was in James 4, verse 6, which says, For God resists the proud, but he gives grace, what? To the humble. So I'm going to see if you guys remember how to make space for grace. So if we're going to make space for grace, we need to drive pride aside. Okay, so let's say it together. To make space for grace, say it together, make space for grace, we need to drive pride aside. How many of you remember the, 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 the homework sheets that I gave out and you guys were checking to see if there was pride in your heart? You guys remember that? Some of you did it. And um, the reality is if, if we don't drive pride out of our lives, then grace will not rest on us anymore. We're saved, but we don't have God's divine influence flowing through us so it will transform us. So we have to make space for grace by driving pride aside. And so I gave you these, these, these sheets to, to hand out and or that I handed out these homework sheets to identify pride in your life. And how many went through the questions? Let me see your hands. A few of you did, just as I predicted. Most of us won't do it, right? And so, because we're so busy. Um, I said do it every day, and my wife and I did it one day. So see, I'm not picking on you. The problem was we're so busy, we never do what we're supposed to do. So here's the thing. All right. So we talked about Lucifer's fall. How many remember that? That's in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 to 14. And I just want to touch on that again. How are you fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning? You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroy the nations of the world. Okay, next verse. For you said, in, you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain, of, uh, uh, the, mountain of, of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. So it's very important to understand what's happening here is Lucifer basically said, I will ascend above the stars of God. The stars speak of angels. He said, I'm going to be better than the other angels that God created. See, see, Lucifer was a beautiful being. He had all these pipes in him, and he, he, he was clothed with glory, and he had all, all the precious stones were in him, and he was a beautiful thing. And it's not a sin to recognize that you're awesome. But it's a, it, it, it's a sin to think that you're more awesome than somebody else. And so God didn't have an issue with, with, with Lucifer recognizing that he was created in, a, in an awesome manner, that he was awesome. He had a problem with him thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm more important than the other angels, and I'm going to ascend above them. And then he said, not only that, I, I'm as awesome as God. I'm going to step into God's place and be like the Most High. That's what pride is. And the Bible says that he was cast down from heaven. 
You know, it says here in, in Genesis, and I don't have the scripture there, Genesis 127, says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male or female, he created them. And you know what? Our value begins with the fact that God has made us in his very image. Why am I saying this? Because it's not prideful to stand in the mirror and go, I'm pretty awesome. And you know what? If you have an, an issue with that statement, maybe you're not confident. Maybe you don't love yourself. And I'll say this because how is it you can stand and look out at the mountains and at the beach and the nature that God created? Who created? God created and say, that's awesome. The, the work of your hands is magnificent, but we stand in the mirror and go, I don't know if God loves me. I'm not that good. It's awesome to stand in the mirror and say, God, you did a good job. You did a really good job. Like, you knew what you were doing. You broke the mold when you made me, Father, you know? God, it's, it's okay to be confident, see, in who God made you to be, because he created us in his image, amen? amen? And so many times we get this false sense of humility where, where we're not confident in who God made us to be, and that's not the way it's supposed to be. And actually, David writes this in Psalm 139, verse 13 to 14. He says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. All right, we got the scripture there. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. He says here, your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. So he's standing there and, and he's saying, God, you did a really good job when you made me. Isn't that what he's doing? He's recognizing that he was made in the image of God and that God has, 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 has put in him everything that he needs to be a success. And I'm afraid that many times we can fall into a false humility. And we almost think it's spiritual to say, woe is me, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm just a piece of dirt. And, you know, somehow God's going to find something in me to, you know, God is awesome, but I'm not awesome. That doesn't make sense. You're awesome because he's made, you, God made you in his image, which makes you awesome. Is this too much for you? And uh, we have to make a decision in our life at some point, whether you're a Christian or not, whether or not you're going to look at the glass as half empty or half full. You're going to perceive everything in life with a half-empty glass or a half-full of glass. And you might not place value on yourself, but I'll tell you something. God places great value on your soul. I mean, God cares so much about us. And, you know, I find that interesting. That's why men are drawn to heroism. You know, you watch movies and you see, you know, the hero of the movie, you know, and you're like, it does something in us men to see, you know, someone like Braveheart that goes in and just kicks butt, right? And, and everyone's like, he's, he's a hero. Why? God's called us to do great exploits. And so when we see that, we get excited. Women, you watch movies and you see this woman come in and she's really hot and she attracts the men and all the men are like, oh, she's, and they're all fighting over her. And women are feeling like, that's pretty awesome. I, I'm interested in that. Why? Because God has created women to be beautiful. God has created men to do exploits. Amen? And so there's something in us that draws us to that kind of stuff. Heroism, beauty. Why? And I think that when God created Eve, he presented him to Adam, and Adam said, she's good. I mean, he was, God knew exactly what Adam needed, and I think Adam looked at her and said, you did a good job, Father. I mean, this is awesome. God, you're so great. Like, this is perfect. The, so the form thing, where did you come up with that? I mean, that's awesome. And so God was excited to make Adam what he needed. And, you know, the enemy wants us to, to think that God is looking, us in, looking at us in a fallen state. But we're not in a fallen state. We've been redeemed. We've been bought back. We belong to God. We're not fallen anymore. We don't look at ourselves as little worms that are trying to get by. We look at ourselves as the children of God. Look at this verse here in Isaiah 49, verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the sons of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. This is awesome. Will God forget us? Yes or no? And, and it's, it's interesting how he, how he touches on this here. He says, 
Um, can a woman forget her nursing child? I will, I will have compassion on the son of a woman. Surely they may forget. Have you ever known a woman who, who forgets her child? Actually, last Halloween, my wife and I, we take our kids out for a meal. We don't celebrate Halloween because it's our personal conviction. So we're, we're out uh, at a restaurant. We come back, and we go into the house, and we're just having a good time. We're talking, putting everyone to bed and eating and everything. And all of a sudden, we hear the doorbell ring. It's 20 minutes later, and it's our six-year-old, Sarah, and she's crying. She's like, you forgot me in the car, and she's crying, and she's weeping. I said, well, why? She couldn't get her car seat undone, and she was just, you know, and we were telling her how evil Halloween night is, and she's like, ah! you know, sitting in the car, and she's scared, and she's bawling. Do you remember that? And, and we forgot her in the car. But see, God's not like that. God will not forget us. God has a good memory. You know, once we were sitting on the couch, I had the baby on my lap, and I'm rocking the baby. And uh, Camilla says, will you go pop us some popcorn? So I put the baby on the couch, and I go and get some popcorn. I pop it. I come back with a bowl, and watching our movie, and I sit on the baby. Do you guys remember that story? And the baby got stuck between the cushion. See, God doesn't forget us. We do stupid stuff. And, it, you know, I thought I sat on a squeaky toy. It was a squeak. And I was like, it was my son. And... Um, even if you're forsaken by family and friends, people have forgotten about you and sat on you on the couch. I mean, you're always cherished by God. God will not forget you. He knows where he's placed you. He knows where you are, and he's going to reach you where you are. Amen? As long as you keep your heart turned to him. Here, here's another verse, Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's pretty good. Did we lose our projector? It's not, it's not on there? Okay. It's all right. Just listen. God's thoughts towards you are wonderful. He has great plans for your life. And he has great thoughts for us. The Bible says his thoughts are as numerous as the sands of the seas. If he's concerned about the sparrow, he doesn't know. There's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that he doesn't know about. How much more does he care for you? God's love for us is incredible. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. That's Jeremiah 31, verse 3. His love for us is relentless, immeasurable, and infinite. Here's another verse here, Romans 5, 8. For God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The creator of life loves us so much and so intensely that even before we would repent, he came and died for us. Have you ever thought about that? Do you know? Because it's great value. If you're going to buy a supercar, if you want a Ferrari, for example, they're going to custom make the car. Okay, you have to pay up front a big, de a big deposit, and then you have to wait a year while they make the car, and you've got to anticipate it. Because you're going to get this beautiful car and you're going to put, you're going to value this car. So you're willing to wait. Why? Because there's value in it. Do you know that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You were not even born yet. God says, I, j I just can't wait. I can't wait to have them in my family again. I'm going to put a down payment. I'm going to, I'm going to send my son to die in their place. Even they hate me now. They, they, they don't understand how much I love them, but I'm going to do it in advance. I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till my spirit begins to woo them because I love them so much. They're so valuable to me. Here's another one, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19. Do we have that one up there? Okay. Knowing that you're not redeemed with the corruptible things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. See, God was willing to pay the highest price in the universe to redeem you, the blood of his dear son. That's how much he cares for you. Would you give one of your children for somebody else? He loves us so much. We're so precious. We're the crown of his creation. He so wants to be in relationship because he loves us so much that he said, I'm going to pay the most expensive currency, which is the blood of my own son, to redeem them back because I love them that much. I don't think we can grasp this, guys. Only by the Spirit of God can we grasp this. Another one is 1 John 3, verse 1. If you're writing it down, behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. God actually considers us to be his own precious children. 
That's an amazing verse. And then Ephesians 2, verse 4 to 7. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, that in the ages to come we might show the exceeding riches of his greatness and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. And so that's telling us that God has planned a magnificent future of continually giving us kindness for the ages to come, for eternity. God just wants to be kind to you. He wants to love you. He wants to manifest himself to you. He wants to have relationship for eternity. That's how much he cares. That's how precious we are to him. And then 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. Okay? And so our high calling is actually this, that we would be ambassadors to share the love of God with others. So why is God pleading and begging? The word pleading is the same word as begging. God is begging through us, be reconciled to me. Why? Because people are precious. God, people are precious to God. It doesn't matter who they are. He loves them. He died for them. And so you, you come, and, and, and if you don't understand how much he loves you, you can't, you can't give what you haven't experienced. Once you experience God's love, you can't help but say, hey, hey, you got to know God's love. You have to know that he loves you. He, he died for you. He said, You're not going to do that unless you love yourself. And the only way you can love yourself is if God reveals how precious you are to him. That's when the value comes in. Does that make sense? So there's two questions we need to ask today. Why is it important to recognize that you're awesome? Can you say that? Say, I'm awesome. And it, it, there's a reason that you have to recognize this, because Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 39. Do we have that one? Good. We have a scripture. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. The next verse, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And it's not prideful to love yourself. I, I was out praying the other day, and I was walking to the street. I was saying, God, I thank you. You're so awesome. Thank you for making such a good product. Thank you for revealing to me how precious I am to you, because you know what? You know, I just, I just want to serve you, because you're, you're awesome. Does it make sense to you guys? You have to rec- If you don't love yourself, how can you love others? How can you take care of others? How can you care about others? Unless you understand how valuable you are, you will never uh, realize, you'll never share with others how valuable they are to God. Why? Because you can't give what you have not experienced. If you do not cherish and value yourself, you cannot from the heart cherish and value another. And that's the biggest problem we run into today. People are so self-centered because they're trying to find their identity and they're trying to feel valued and they're trying to feel like they're precious. And so they're, they're looking for, if they would understand that they are already precious and valuable in God's eyes, then they, they would just give it out instead of looking for it all the time. God believes in you and will go out of his way to encourage you. That's the God that we serve. Amen. And so we have, we have to kind of look at, look at it this way. See, I like to look everything from the, the glass is half full instead of half empty, right? And look, it's kind of like this. So I was doing windows before when I had my window company. I would go into people's homes, and, and I'd come in, and they said, would you please take your shoes off? And there'd be, like, food stuck on the carpet and, you know, you know, dog hair all over the place, and someone spilt the, the, you know, the grape juice, and it's like, and I'm like... I don't want to take my shoes off. Would you please take <laughs> No. <laughs> I don't want to get my socks dirty, right? But if you walk into a house, and the house is like super clean, and it's like, you know, got marble floor, and it's, it's, it's polished clean and everything, you just, you just, oh, I got to take my shoes off. You take them off without anybody asking you because you don't want to defile the home, amen? And this is what it's like as a Christian. You can come with this worm mentality and say, woe is me, I'm a sinner, and, you know, uh, I, I'm on my journey, but, you know, God hasn't perfected me yet. And all that. you think this way constantly, and it's like you're going into the dirty. Well, why, why bother taking my shoes off? I'm a mess anyway. You know, I'll just, you know, it, you know, God will understand. But if you see your life that you've been bought and paid for with the blood of Jesus, you're a new creature. God has made you holy. You're a vessel of honor. When something comes up, you're like, oh, I've got to get that out of my life. I don't want to defile the carpet. Got to get this out of my life because I'm precious to God. I'm valuable to God, which makes me valuable. And so I don't want to defile myself. I'm the temple of the living God. You see the different way of looking at it? 
See, God cherishes us. God values us. I want to look at one more scripture before we pass here. Judges chapter 6, verse 11 to 16. And this is talking about Gideon. And I love Gideon because Gideon didn't have any self-confidence, right? He didn't believe in himself. But how many know God believed in Gideon? Just like he believes in us. The angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Oprah. And you like that one, right? Which belonged to Joash, the clan of Ebuzer. Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The Midianites were oppressing the people of Israel. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, and I love this, he said, mighty hero. And in the King James, it's man of great valor. I love it. And I think that's what God would say to you. God would come to you and say, you're a mighty hero. You're, you're a person of great valor. And you'd be like, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. Because you don't know when I created you, I put greatness inside of you. And you need to believe in yourself. And you, people are like, I can't believe in myself because then it's like, it's humanism. No, you can believe in yourself because God created you perfect. Amen? The only time you don't believe in yourself is if you're not connected in relationship with the Lord. Then you're going to get messed up. But if you're in relationship with the Lord, you're in a good place. He gets, so God says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And then he says here, Sir Gideon replied, the Lord is with us. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles of our ancestors that the ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites, I'm sending you. Okay? But, the Lord, but Lord Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. I am the least of my entire family. I'm a loser, God. Don't you know that? I can't do anything right. And the Lord said to him, I will be with you. And here's the key. And you will destroy the Midianites, as if you're fighting against one man. Right? So here's a couple keys out of that passage. God has given you strength. And in that strength, God says, you're a hero. God has put something in you. You have a purpose. You have a destiny. God has you here for a reason. And God would say to you, you're a hero in this area, and I'm going to use you. You just have to believe in yourself. Believe that God, I've put in you what you need to get the job done. Amen? Believe in yourself because I am with you. And that is the key. You know, God rebuked me one day because I, I used to tell people, they would say, Travis, you're awesome. And I'd say, no, no, only God is awesome. And, and, and God spoke to me, no, you are awesome because you're made in my image. And then now I don't stop people. People say, you're awesome. I go, I know, thank you. <laughs> but you know what? You're awesome too. And when you think you're awesome, then you start to look at other people as awesome. When you begin to cherish yourself and realize that you're precious and you're, you're, you're highly valued by God, then you begin to highly value others. You begin to love others because if you don't love yourself, you cannot love another. But if you love yourself, you'll begin to love others. Amen? And he is with us. Here's the key. God is with us, so you will destroy your enemies. The struggles that you have will be destroyed. And here's the word. With ease. Why? Because God is with you, and you recognize that because he's with you, you're a great hero, and you can do the impossible because he's with you. Simple. So when does self-adoration become prideful? When you begin to think you're more valuable than other people. And there's, there's the key right there. The sin of Lucifer was not recognizing, recognizing that he was beautiful. It was lifting himself above other angels and lifting himself up to the place of divinity okay philippians chapter 2 verse 4 don't look out only for your don't look out only for your interests but take interest in other people also don't just look out for your own interests see it's not wrong to have interests and say you know i'd like to do this in life you know i'm you know I, I'm, I'm proud of my accomplishments and all this it's not wrong to do that it's just always look out for the interests of others and if you if you're putting yourself above others and you're struggling with pride but you need to be confident all right? And what happened with um, Lucifer, God said, because you have proud, you, pride, you will be brought down to the lowest depth in the pit. 
And so Lucifer, is he in a redeemed state or is he in a fallen state? He's in a fallen state. And um, as believers, we've been restored back into relationship with God. So the enemy can't, he can't change the fact that you belong to God and you're going to heaven and you're serving God. But he might want you to think from a fallen state. Oh, I'm unworthy and I can't amount and God doesn't love me and all this stuff. You're going to heaven, but you're miserable because you don't love yourself. God wants us to love ourselves so that we can love others. Amen? And um, I got a verse for you guys this week. And I'm sorry this message is massively choppy because God just downloaded it and I'm just working it out. But here's, here's what I want you to do this week. Phili- uh, Psalms chapter 139, verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read it here. Can we bring it up on the screen? Okay. You made all my delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. I'd like you to take that verse this week, if you can, and pray it. And look at yourself in the mirror and say this, thank you, Lord, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is awesome. Can you do that this week? Just begin to declare what God says about you instead of what you feel about you. And watch what God will do. Do you know what will happen? With it? If you do that every day for a few weeks, You say, I can't say good things about myself. I'll get proud. No, what will happen is you'll begin to have a revelation of how awesome you are, and then you're going to begin to recognize how awesome other people are, and you're going to start to love on other people. Does that make sense? Because now you're looking at life from God's perspective and not from your own. Let's stand together and pray. And Don, I'll have you come up to to do your song, the worship team. Uh, We're going to do a song. Father, I thank you for every person in this place. Lord, that we would, we would have a revelation of your goodness, that we would have a revelation of your love for us, and that we'd understand how valuable we are to you, God. Uh, you think about us all the time. You care about us. You're concerned about us. You're patiently waiting to bring judgment because you want as many people to come to you as possible. You're such a good and caring Father. So, Father, I pray, God, that every person under the sound of my voice this week, Lord, that you begin to speak to them about how valuable they are to you, how precious they are to you. Father, even this week as they do this homework assignment and they begin to declare over themselves that your workmanship is marvelous, that they begin to believe it by the Spirit of God, by the Spirit of grace, so that they might go and love others in Jesus' name. Amen.